Hello, I'm Peter Kistler from Heart Rhythm TV, and it's my great pleasure to be joined by Professor Pierre Jais from uh, Bordeaux, France. Uh, Pierre, welcome, and thank you very much for joining us on Heart Rhythm TV. Thank you very much, Peter, for the invitation. Uh, Pierre, I thought that we might uh, take an opportunity to uh, hear your thoughts on a fairly common clinical conundrum, I think, that we see nowadays in the EP lab. And that's when patients come back with documented recurrent atrial fibrillation. And we put our catheters in and we find that their pulmonary veins are still isolated. Um, firstly, perhaps if we um, discuss your approach to the patient with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, so um, episodes less than 24 hours, they come to the lab in sinus rhythm, and then perhaps we'll talk about uh, persistent AF. Well, as surprisingly as it may sound, this situation is easier to um, approach for persistent AF than for paroxysmal, in my opinion. Because uh, most paroxysmal patients respond well to PVI. And if they don't, it probably means that you have some focal uh, arrhythmia uh, coming from somewhere. And identifying that somewhere is uh, a real challenge. So, you, you know, as I, as I do the uh, usual uh, suspects, um, superior vena cava, for example, uh, might be an area that you want to investigate. Very rarely inferior vena cava, there are very few reports of um, muscular sleeves in that vein that can be arrhythmogenic. Very unusual, but good to know. You never know. And then, um, you know, and this is something that comes from Australia, that focal arrhythmia may happen from rings of fire. Uh, yeah. So um, <laughs> around the uh, tri-speed analysts and mitral analysts, um, this, this is something you, you may want to investigate. Coronary sinuses as well. We've seen really difficult cases with some focal arrhythmia from the coronary sinus. Um, in um, left atrial appendage, of course, um, um, may be a source. It's rare in our experience. It's about 2% of our patients, so very, very limited. And none of these areas are common. I mean, yeah. it, it can be found there, but it's rare. The same for the CPU vena cava. It's no more than 2% in our experience. So mm -hmm. there is nothing here to uh, justify a systematic approach that would aggressively uh, target or isolate those structures. Um, you have to be lucky. Um, Isoproteinol, of course, may help. Um, and then, you know, as, as I know that um, using ATP challenge for PVI, uh, truly permanent disconnection is a good idea. There has been some reports of, yeah. uh, you know, some probably kind of intermittent reconnections. Um, due to very significant lesions, but sometimes it's not uh, good enough. Um, the area... Yeah, Pierre, Pierre, would your first step then in the paroxysmal with enduring PVI be uh, isoproteranol infusion to elicit those triggers, or do you empirically go to those sites? No, I, 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 would, I, I would definitely use isoproteranol. Um, I mean, if I understand your question, we are in this redo situation, right? Yes. All the veins are isolated and yes. it's not in the first place. Um, yes, that's something we do, knowing that um, it's not easy. It's really not easy. I mean, uh, using a multi-electrode catheter is a good idea. It's better if you choose something that is not inducing too much um, 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 uh, PACs, because yeah. otherwise you're, you know, fooled. Uh, and this, this may happen with isoproteinol even more. Um, and we also know, and it's, it's a bit of old knowledge, but um, we also know that isoproteinol may not be specific and you may induce something that is not clinical and that yeah. is not what you are chasing. So uh, fortunately, this is not common. And the last thing I, I'd like to say is that I had the feeling, but it's very limited experience, that in some patients in whom the veins are isolated 
and the arrhythmia preferentially occurs during exercise, then the vein of Marshall may be of interest. Okay. Um, and it's not something we do systematically, far from that, we tried. We did some uh, Marshall vein systematic alcoholization in that case scenario, and it didn't help, generally speaking. But maybe that in those patients with exercise-related arrhythmia, it could be um, helpful. So your approach then in the paroxysmal would be to target the SVC coronary sinus. So thinking about tubular or venous structures. Absolutely. We would start okay. by that and, okay. and try to understand whether these are arrhythmogenic or not. Um, in, and the first thing, you know, so when you investigate a vena cava, you will identify the uh, venous potentials. Uh, it's the very sharp activity, of course. And you can also have an idea of um, something that is not completely normal. If you see fractionation there, or if you see some kind of delay um, that is more than usual, typically there is very, very little delay there. If mm -hmm. it's something like, I don't know, uh, 50 milliseconds, that's not normal. Same for the pulmonary veins, by the way. In the early days, we noticed that uh, those venous potentials, when they were delayed, the vein was way more arrhythmogenic. So then so, if we could just finish off with your approach to persistent AF then when, when they've oh, yeah. come back for another procedure, and, and it might not be a procedure that's been done in Bordeaux. So let's say they've just had their veins isolated oh, and they come okay. back to the lab in atrial fibrillation. Okay. Uh, then, um, as I said earlier, I think it's an easier uh, situation because you still have the... Uh, leverage of uh, using lines in mm -hmm. um, the martial vein isolation. So this is typically what we would do for that patient. And again, it, it works really well. The alcoholization provides a very stable and durable mitral isthmus block. Um, finally, after so many years <laughs> struggling yeah. with that line. Um, and, and this approach is associated was much less uh, arrhythmia recurrences and particularly atrial tachycardia recurrences, probably because as compared to a more, um, you know, this, this part of the ablation procedure that I was targeting the uh, complex fractionated potentials resist, resulted in quite some atrial tachycardia, probably producing some anchoring lesions for these things to happen uh, somehow. So this is what we would do. And then we sometimes have cases where despite the completion of PVI plus lines and martial vein al alcoholization, we still have some arrhythmia. And these are difficult ones, fortunately not that frequent. Um, there are areas where you have um, some localized reentry uh, preferentially happening and typically the interior aspect of the left atrium is one of these. Um, and it's, it's very interesting that um, it is typically where the um, ascending aorta is, mm. you know, um, in contact with the interior wall of the left atrium. It seems there has been some papers suggesting that there is a relationship here. Um, and, uh, but this is an area where you see electrical abnormalities, even sinus rhythm, in, in quite often. I mean, this. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the things uh, we we will lo look at. Um, and if you have an an organized rhythm, uh, then with multi electrode catheters mapping and navigation yeah. systems, you have a very good chance to uh, understand what is going on and 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 to ablate. Um, uh, this arrhythmia. If it's AF, it's more difficult. And then uh, you start looking into the right atrium, etc. So are you are you um, you're looking to terminate AF with ablation then in that recurrent persistent situation rather than cardioversion and doing your lines in sinus rhythm? No, this this is something uh, we 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 uh, could consider. I like working in atrial fibrillation to begin with because it gives you the opportunity. For example, I have a couple of patients in whom just the alcoholization of the vein of Marshall terminated the fibrillation. Okay. 
Okay. And one of them was coming from Italy. He was in fibrillation for three years, uninterrupted. Mm. In, wow. I was shocked. It terminated mm. with alcohol injection in the con in the uh, martial vein. So it gives you the opportunity to understand, and it's not frequent because it it, it doesn't terminate in more than forty percent, for fifty percent of patients. So, mm -hmm. but sometimes you learn a little bit by doing so, mm -hmm. and then pretty quickly after we deploy the set of lesions, if it's not terminated, we cardiovert and complete in sinus rhythm because you do a much better job in sinus rhythm. Yeah. This is for sure. Yeah. I mean, understanding where the gaps are in the line yeah. is so much easier in sinus rhythm. Yeah. Okay. And, and perhaps I'll conclude just as, a, as an Australian uh, question, um, your thoughts about addressing lifestyle factors like alcohol and obesity and <laughs> how does that work in Bordeaux? <laughs> Cheers. I wish I, I wish these problems would be limited to Australia. They're not, but the solution came from Australia and and price centers somehow. Um, you know, yeah, this is something we look at. So, uh, um, sleep apnea syndrome, obesity, mm -hmm. and and uh, we're very grateful to uh, uh, you guys who, uh, uh, that you uh, uh, taught us. Uh, that a, a weight uh, loss was associated. Uh, so I think 10% weight loss is associated with 20% increase in, in, in success, whatever treatment you use, not just ablation uh, for AF. So yeah, that, that's something we, we, we target aggressively. We're not that successful when it comes to alcohol here. <laughs> yeah. I, I must admit. <laughs> oh, it's difficult here as well. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, look, really appreciate your time, uh, Pierre. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. My pleasure.